Gridding is the process whereby a set of irregularly distributed points are converted to a regularly spaced grid. The control point input can represent any numeric observation, such as the properties listed here. It is assumed, however, that the control points can be described in terms of x, y, and z, z being a numeric value representing a geological, geochemical, geotechnical, or geophysical parameter. The gridding process starts with an imaginary grid. Each element of this grid is referred to as a cell. The midpoint of a cell is referred to as a node. The gridding process involves the estimation of the node values based on the surrounding control points. The method or technique used to estimate these values is known as an algorithm. Rockworks has many gridding algorithms, which we'll describe in subsequent videos. Rockworks stores the interpolated numeric values for each cell within files with an RWGRD extension, such as surface topography.rwgrd. Grids can be displayed in a variety of ways. For example, if we color code the cells and make them small enough, a color-coded contour map will be produced. We can draw lines around similar cells to produce contour maps. And we can use the z-values as elevations to produce 3D mesh diagrams and shaded surfaces. It is very important to understand that a grid, as stored within an RWGRD file, is just an array of numbers. It is not a diagram. These numeric models what Rockworks uses to perform volumetric computations, slope analysis, time-based animations, and so on. The Rockworks Gridding Options menu includes 13 algorithms, including Closest Point, Cumulative, Dip-Based, Directional, Distance to Point, Inverse Distance, Krieging, Planar Fitting, Sample Density, Trend Polynomial, Trend Residuals, triangulation, and hybrid. To ask which algorithm is the best is like asking which one of these tools is the best. As you'll see within the next 13 videos describing each algorithm, the best method depends upon the type of data that you're modeling and the particular analysis that you're trying to perform. The closest point gridding algorithm assigns each grid node to a value equal to the value at the closest control point. This method can be used to model data that is not gradational. For example, consider a data set where the z-value represents a lithotype. We'll start with a control point map that shows the comments being the lithotypes. If we grid the z-values with the closest point algorithm, we get a model that approximates a geologic map. In conclusion, advantages? The grid value range will be equal to the data point range. The maximum and minimum values will correspond exactly with the control point values. Grid nodes will honor the control points. It's good for modeling discrete non-gradational data. Disadvantages? Produces discontinuous grid models with abrupt changes between grid cells. The cumulative gridding method assigns node values by adding the z values for all control points that reside within the corresponding grid cell. This method is useful for modeling cumulative production or weighted occurrence data. Advantages? Useful for modeling cumulative data such as production. Useful for mapping weighted occurrence data such as multi-element geochemical data. Disadvantages? It's not intended for modeling structural surfaces or isopacks, and it cannot be used in conjunction with the declustering option. Dip-based gridding biases the surface modeling based on the dip direction and dip angle at the control points. Consider this example in which we have a list of XYZ point data. Some of the points have strike and dip information and some don't. If we process the XYZ data, with another algorithm such as Krieging, we get this grid. 
if, on the other hand, we grid all the data XYZ and strike dip with the dip based gridding algorithm, we get a very different model. This is because the dip based modeling is using the strike and dip information to construct imaginary planes to project the surface up dip and down dip. The differences between the two models are profound. If you have strikes and dips for your control points, give the dip based algorithm a try. Advantages? Dip based gridding projects the surface based on the strike and dip data. It also uses the XYZ points that lack strike and dip data, and it's great for data in which XYZ are coplanar but strikes and dips are available. Disadvantages? It's applicable only to geologic structure or elevations. It often creates bullseyes for areas without strike and dip data. Directional weighting allows you to specify a trend direction and strength to bias the modeling along the trend. There are three types of directional weighting algorithms, bidirectional, unidirectional, and custom. The bidirectional algorithm has two modes, automatic and manual. The automatic option will attempt to find a trend and bias the model accordingly. The bidirectional manual option allows the user to define the bias direction and relative strength. The unidirectional algorithm is similar except that the biasing only applies in one direction. This is useful for modeling flow systems. The custom option allows the user to create a table in order to bias along multiple trends such as conjugate fractures within carbonates. Advantages? Directional gridding has the same advantages as inverse distance but it also permits for directional bias. Disadvantages are that it can apply directional trends even if there are none, so be careful. The distance to point algorithm simply assigns each grid node a value equal to the distance to the closest control point. GIS oriented applications include distance to market, distance to railhead, and distance to pipe junction mapping. But the real power of distance to point gridding involves qualified resource and contamination estimations. To illustrate, let's start with this contamination isopack. According to the Rockworks 17 Utilities Statistics Report, the volume of contaminated soil is 722,579 cubic meters. To add more credibility to this estimate, the volumetrics should be qualified based on the distance from the estimated cells to the control points. We start by filtering the distance to point grid into three Boolean models based on distances that are determined by the spatial variability of the data. For example, the measured classification will be considered as cells within 10 meters of a control point. The indicated classification will be considered as cells between 10 and 20 meters of a control point, and the inferred classification will be considered as cells between 20 and 40 meters of a control point. All other cells will be discarded. These Boolean grids are made up of ones and zeros. By multiplying the original isopack by the Boolean grids, we can qualify the volumetrics into measured, indicated, and inferred categories. Advantages? Distance to point gridding can be useful for GIS modeling, such as performing distance to market analyses. Distance to point gridding, more importantly, can be used in conjunction with Boolean math operations to compute qualified resource or contaminant estimates based on cutoff distances between the original control points and the interpolated cell nodes. Disadvantages? Distance to point gridding does not illustrate the data itself, just the proximity of grid model nodes relative to the original data and distance to point gridding is not intended for modeling structural surfaces or isopacks. Inverse distance gridding assigns node values by computing a distance weighted average of neighboring control points. 
This algorithm is based on Newton's gravity equation. Specifically, the effect of a neighboring control point varies inversely by its distance squared. Although squaring the distance is a good starting point, Rockworks allows the user to change this exponent. This animation shows how increasing the weighting exponent causes distant control points to exert less influence when estimating the grid node value. Conversely, lowering the weighting exponent causes distant control points to exert a greater influence on the estimation. The number of neighboring points used for the estimation also has an effect upon the interpolation as shown within this animation. The method used to locate neighboring points can be defined by sectors to minimize the effects of large nearby clusters of control points. As with some of the other gridding algorithms, inverse distance is sensitive to the grid dimensions. As the cells become smaller, bullseyes begin to appear around the control points. The solution is to set the node spacing equal to no less than one-fourth of the average minimum distance between the control points. Advantages? When used properly, inverse distance gridding produces a smooth and continuous grid. It does not exaggerate extrapolations beyond neighboring control points. The range of grid values will be smaller than the data point range, meaning that the highest grid value will be less than the maximum data point, and the lowest grid value will be greater than the minimum data point. The disadvantages are that inverse distance gridding can produce a bullseye effect with some data sets, especially when the cells are set too small. Krieging uses directional statistics to influence the weighting assigned to surrounding control points when estimating the node values. These directional statistics, or geostatistics, use variograms in a process called Krieging to define the control point weighting factors that are used during the gridding process. The basic idea behind a variogram is that the variability or differences between data points increase with distance. When the distance between data points is small, the points tend to be similar and the variability has a small value. As the distance between data points increases, the points tend to become less similar and the variability increases. Eventually, the distance between data points will be great enough that the points are no longer considered to be related to each other. The variability will flatten out into a sill. The range represents the distance within which the data points are considered to be related to one another. The relatedness of close points is not a huge surprise, but are points more related in one direction than another? This question is answered by constructing a series of variograms for point pairs that are filtered by direction. Once a curve has been selected, either automatically or manually, a comparison of the maximum and minimum ranges defines the anisotropy, or directionality, of the data. This anisotropy is graphically depicted by a directionality ellipse whose long axis corresponds to the direction that will be favored when performing the Krieging. The shape of the ellipse, or the major-minor axis ratio, is indicative of the degree of anisotropy that will influence the Krieging process. In practice, the Rockworks Automatic Variography option creates these directional variograms for a variety of geostatistical settings and then selects the one with the best correlation coefficient to use for the subsequent gridding. These variograms plot the lateral variability of observed control point pairs for various directions. A series of curve types are then best fit to the observations. These curve types include exponential, Gaussian, linear, and spherical. Directional ellipses are created to define the shape of the predicted variograms as a function of direction. The selected variogram type and directional ellipse are then used to interpolate the grid node values. The manual variography option allows the user to enter their own geostatistical parameters for the subsequent variogram construction.
Both the automatic and manual variography options allow the user to interactively modify the variogram and directional ellipsoid parameters before generating the grid model. The geostatistical input parameters within the manual variography input menu are defined as follows. Since variograms represent point-to-point -point variability, the program creates a set of point pairs to work with. Rather than analyzing all possible pairings between all data points, a huge number, the program will sample point pairs along specific directional bearings. These bearing lines can be conceptualized as bidirectional spokes running through the data points. You define the spacing in degrees between sampling spokes. For example, a 45 degree spoke spacing will generate four directional spokes and a 30 degree spoke spacing will generate six spokes. In addition to the program searching for data points in a directional manner, it also searches in distance increments along each bearing line. These are expressed in map units. This variable establishes the maximum distance from each data point that the data search will be conducted in map units. Use this drop-down menu to select the variogram model to apply to the gridding process. This setting tells Rockworks to first create a regular grid of points using inverse distance squared, which will then be used for generating the variogram. Keeping this turned on can create better variograms for small data sets. Turning this off can help create a better match between automatic and manual settings. Check this box to see the interactive variogram editor prior to gridding. Check this box to generate a textual report that lists the various Krieging parameters that were used to create the grid model. Check this box to generate a detailed diagram that depicts all of the variograms and a large number of other statistics. Krieging is the process of determining the weights to assign the given data points to minimize the error in a grid node assignment based on the selected variogram. This prompt permits you to specify just how many data points will be used and weighted in estimating the value for a given grid node. A typical value is 6. The greater the value, the more regional the gridding. The maximum number you can choose is 64. Using more neighbors can result in a smoother, less polygonal model. The options within the interactive variogram editor are described as follows. When the variogram editor is first displayed, the best fit variogram will be displayed if automatic variography was selected. Otherwise, the user selected variogram from the manual variography sub options menu will be shown. Either way, you can click on the pull-down button and change the type of variogram. The correlation coefficient reports how well the variogram model fits the data. A value of 1.0 represents a perfect direct relationship, 0 means no relationship, and minus 1 means a perfect inverse relationship. This reports the directionality of the data and equals the minor axis range divided by the major axis range. The closer to 1, the less directional or anisotropic the data. These geostatistical settings are either automatically computed if you use the automatic variography option or manually specified if you use the manual variography option. Move the major axis slider to adjust the direction of the directional ellipse. Move the major axis range slider to define the length of the directional ellipse. Move the minor axis range slider to change the length of the minor axis for the directional ellipse. Note the checkbox labeled All at the base of the semi-variogram direction column. If you turn this off, the direction slider is enabled. By changing the direction slider, you can select the variogram along a given direction. If the variogram does not go through the origin, that jump up the y-axis is called the nugget. 
It indicates that even at very close distances, there is some variability. Moving the nugget slider will set the nugget threshold. Finally, moving the sill slider will adjust the distance at which the variogram begins to flatten. And now for some recommendations. If the automatic option produces a satisfactory map, stop there and be done with it. If the map that is generated by the automatic option isn't to your liking, start off by modifying the settings generated by the automatic option. Keep it simple. You can start with a linear no nugget model. This indicates that there is a linear relationship between distance and point variability and that there is not a great sampling error. Compare the maps produced by the Krieging with other algorithms such as triangulation, gridding, and trend service analysis to see if there really is a directionality to your data. And when using Krieging as with directional weighting, it is possible to create trends where trends don't actually exist, so be careful. Advantages? Krieging is a good all-around modeling method. It's excellent at defining directional trends within your data, and it can prevent the bullseye effect associated with inverse distance. The disadvantages are that it's complex, should you opt for the manual settings. Plane fit gridding uses a best fit algorithm to fit a flat plane to the data. The most common application involves the determination of the regional hydrologic gradient based on three wells. More esoteric applications include the identification of data that deviates from the regional gradient. This is accomplished by using the plane fit algorithm in conjunction with the high fidelity option. Advantages? Plane fit gridding is useful for modeling potentiometric surfaces based on three points or wells. It's useful for creating simplified regional dip models. It shows deviations from regional dip when used in conjunction with the high fidelity option. Disadvantages? The surfaces are limited to planes. Sample density gridding simply counts the number of control points within each cell and assigns the node value for the cell to the control point population within it. Advantages? Sample density gridding is useful for identifying undersampled and oversampled areas. It's useful for contouring relative frequencies such as well density and population distributions. The disadvantages are that it's very sensitive to the cell size, it's not useful for modeling structural surfaces or thickness values, and it should not be used in conjunction with the declustering option. Trend polynomial gridding fits a three-dimensional polynomial equation to the control point data and constructs a grid based on this equation. As shown within the trend polynomial menu, the order of the polynomial determines how many flexures or bending moments the surface will have. A first order polynomial is a flat surface such as a regional dip or a hydrogeological gradient. A second order polynomial produces a single flexure such as a horizontal or plunging anticline or syncline or even a depositional basin. A third order polynomial has two bending moments that might be used to model a complex structure such as an anticline syncline system. The remaining fourth, fifth, and sixth order polynomials are rarely used and we recommend for reasons that will soon become apparent that you avoid using them. The automatic option at the top of the menu will generate all six of the polynomials and choose the most reasonable polynomial that correlates best with the control points. To illustrate the polynomial fitting, we'll start out with a set of control points. As mentioned earlier, the first order polynomial produces a plane. In this case, the plane is dipping to the northwest. The second order polynomial is producing a curved surface similar to the flank of a dome that is also dipping to the northwest. The third order polynomial mimics the northwestern flank of an anticline. 
The fourth order polynomial has produced a basin to the northwest, a dome to the south, and a very steep gradient upwards to the southwest. The fifth order polynomial has produced some nonsensical flexures at every corner of the model. To illustrate how trend surface polynomials can be used to project trends into areas without control points, consider this example. A triangulation based grid will be confined to the area of control despite the obvious trend. Generic inverse distance slightly extends the trend. Automatic Krieging doesn't project the trend, whereas manual Krieging does a much better job but terminates the projection within a short distance. The directional automatic method goes farther, as does the directional manual. But a trend surface polynomial will project infinitely, making it a useful tool for projecting trends into areas without control when used judiciously. We'll be revisiting trend polynomials later on in this series when describing the polyenhance option, which uses polynomials to enhance the regional trend while using other algorithms to model the local perturbations. Advantages Trend polynomial gridding will project trends into areas with no data. Trend polynomial gridding shows regional structures otherwise hidden by high frequency features. Disadvantages? It does not work well with data sets that have no discernible regional trend. It does not honor the control points and it can produce unrealistic flexures when attempting to fit the polynomials to the control points. Trend residuals gridding assigns node values based on the differences between the control points and the regional trends within your data. For example, if we start out with some control points and fit a polynomial to this data as described within the previous video, the differences as shown by the gray tubes between the original control points and the polynomial trend surface represent the residuals. A contour map of these residuals using inverse distance weighting shows the extent to which these observed values differ from the polynomial trend surface. Negative residuals represent points that lie below the polynomial trend surface, while positive points are above the surface. Examining the anomalous residuals is a great way to find bad data such as transposed digits within the z-values or transposed coordinates. Modeling the residuals using other directional algorithms such as Krieging can also be a great way to remove the regional trend in order to see the secondary directionalities. We'll cover this later on in a video that describes the utilities grid trend surface programs. Advantages? Trend surface residuals identifies local anomalies from or relative to the regional trend. Trend surface residuals is good for locating bad data. And trend surface residuals is a good method for removing the regional trend to see secondary features. The disadvantages are that trend surface residuals does not offer meaningful information if there is no regional trend. Triangulation gridding constructs a three-dimensional network of triangles between the control points and then assigns node values based on their intercepts with the triangles. The construction of the network is based on a technique called Delaunay triangulation in which no point is inside the circumcircle of any other triangle. These networks maximize the minimum angles between the triangle limbs, thereby minimizing the number of overly thin triangles. Once the Delaunay network has been created, the program will compute the intersection elevation of each grid node with the enclosing triangle and assign that value to the grid node. The intersection elevation is based on a three-point plane solution. If activated, the interpolate edge points option will insert points along the edge of the project area so that the contours can be drawn to the edge. It does this by inserting five points at equal spacing along the map boundaries with one in each corner and assigns them a value using the inverse distance squared method. Advantages? Triangulation gridding honors the control points. Unlike the easy map triangulation, triangulation gridding allows for 3D surfaces. 
and triangulation gridding is good for beveled geology and engineered surfaces. Disadvantages? Triangulation contours tend to be very angular and triangulation gridding processing can be slow for large data sets. The hybrid gridding uses two or more different interpolation methods in which separate weighting factors are assigned to each algorithm. This program will create one grid for each of the selected algorithms using the settings within the algorithms menu tab. The cells within each of these grids will then be multiplied by the weighting factor assigned to the associated algorithm. These weighted grids will then be added together. This grid is then divided by the sum of all the weighting factors to produce a weighted average hybrid grid. Please note that the weighting factors can be arbitrary. For example, they don't have to add up to 100%. In the previous example, we could have given Krieging a weight of 3 and triangulation a weight of 1 and come up with the same results. This diagram shows all 15 possible combinations of models using equally weighted pairs of algorithms. Given that more than two algorithms may be used to create a hybrid grid, that's 120 possible combinations of equally weighted models. The variable weighting for each method translates to an infinite number of possible combinations. Advantages? Hybrid gridding allows you to utilize the advantages of many algorithms on a single surface. Hybrid gridding provides infinite possibilities. The main disadvantage is that if there's a problem with a particular method, it'll be magnified if it's weighted highly.